So this has been a long time coming. Uh, I love iceberg charts, and I love biology, and I recently just got hold on my de my degree in chemical biology. So it's time. It's time. Today we're going to be going through this biology iceberg that I took time out of my day to make. Yes. Uh, we will be reviewing a lot of biology as a result. Uh, don't worry if you are not really that familiar with biology. Uh, this is going to cover a lot of the key concepts that people learn about when they are studying it. Uh, it's not a catch-all review of biology. There's a lot of stuff that's missing. You know, we're not going through uh, you know, the organelles. We're not going to go through a lot of mechanisms. There's a lot of topics that I left out too that are important, like GMOs. Again, this is just an iceberg chart. Uh, also, I'm going to be oversimplifying a lot of things so if you're very familiar with a certain topic or you're really interested in it please don't you know come at me right i have to fit all of these topics into one video this is literally just for fun so without further ado let's go through my biology iceberg at tier one the top of the iceberg uh and yes i know that i was supposed to start at the sky but there really is nothing that's so simple that i wanted to put it up at the tippy top of the iceberg so we're going to start at the part that is above water. Now, these are things that everyone in their day-to-day -day life has at least some kind of familiarity with. These are kind of like the key things that make up biology. Cells are the functional unit of all life. Now, they consist of a fluid called cytoplasm in their interior and it's surrounded by a plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is very important. Uh, it comes up a lot in biology, probably one of the most important structures that you can learn about. All life is composed of at least one cell, so that would be unicellular life, but most of the life that we can see with our day-to-day -day eyes are called multicellular. More complicated cells have membrane-bound structures that perform functions called organelles, and if they have an organelle called a nucleus, which contains its DNA, its genetic material, then it is called a eukaryotic cell. Any cells that do not have a nucleus are called prokaryotic cells. And as you can imagine, organisms with eukaryotic cells are called eukaryotes, and prokaryotic cells are called prokaryotes. Evolution refers to the process by which life changes over multiple generations in response to competition and environmental pressures. It's driven by genetics, uh, genetic diversity, specifically with mutations over time, and it is extremely important in understanding biology. There is one quote from a scientist named uh, Theodosius Dobzhansky that says that nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution, and I am inclined to agree with that. Uh, by the way, I don't have pictures for all of these, not because I couldn't find any pictures, obviously all of these do have pictures that you can find, but because I didn't think it would be super useful for or necessary for all of these. So uh, some of the more important ones that have diagrams I'll have pictures for, but otherwise uh, most of these will just be me talking, so feel free to just put on this video in the background if you like while you do other things. The definition of life refers to several key criteria that generally biologists agree on that all living things called organisms have to follow. Number one, they must maintain something called homeostasis, in which they can maintain some kind of internal equilibrium. So if you think about humans, when it's hot, we sweat. That is homeostasis. They have some kind of organization. So in humans, think we have our cells, which are organized into body tissues. Multiple tissues make up organs, which have organ systems, uh, which in turn make the organism. Uh, even unicellular life has some kind of degree of organization to it. They grow over time. They can adapt and evolve over generations keyword over generations. They can respond to an external stimulus, so if something happens in the world around them, living things are able to respond to that. They can perform something called metabolism, which is uh, reactions within their body that allow them to produce and uh, use energy. And they can reproduce. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and it is the main genetic uh, information molecule in all of or in all of life together with another nucleic acid called RNA ribonucleic acid it forms the basis of genetics the study of how biological information is passed down from generation to generation DNA passes down information in the form of four nitrogenous base pairs uh, adenine thymine guanine and cytosine 
specific regions of DNA code for specific proteins, and those are called genes. So those regions are called genes. And molecules of DNA are condensed into chromosomes. So if you've ever seen those X-shaped things when people refer to DNA, that is a chromosome. Humans have 23 pairs of them. There is so much that can be said about DNA, and we will be returning to DNA many, many, many times later on in this iceberg because it is so important to biology. But keep in mind that this is an iceberg video, and every explanation that I give is going to be highly condensed. Anatomy refers to the study of the body, and it's often paired with physiology, which is the study of bodily functions. Classification refers to the methods by which life is categorized. Traditionally, we've had Linnaean taxonomy, so think domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. But in light of evolution, we have moved on to cladistics. I'm gonna go on so many tangents, this might be the worst iceberg video of all time. Paleontology refers to the study of extinct life, so life that is no longer alive, uh, entire species that are no longer alive, and it's based on the fossilized remains of organisms and any other remnants that they've left behind, such as their tracks or poop. Ecology is the study of how organisms interact with one another in their environment. Photosynthesis is the biochemical process, or rather series of processes, by which many organisms, plants, but also a lot of bacteria, cyanobacteria, convert energy from the sun into energy in their cells in the form of the sugar molecule glucose. Yes, this is a, an extremely simple, barely a diagram of photosynthesis, but uh, we are not going to go over how photosynthesis works in this video. Camouflage is a defense tactic, or sometimes an offensive tactic, that is used by organisms to hide from predators or hide from their prey by blending into their environment. Uh, this here is a stick insect. It is camouflaging as a stick in order to hide from predators. Pollination is the spread of a plant's genetic material, usually pollen, the thing that causes a lot of people's allergies, allowing that plant's genetic material to move a great distance and potentially intermingle with other plants to produce genetic diversity. It can involve the use of an animal helper called a pollinator, so the most famous example you're probably aware of are bees. Food webs are diagrams that show which organisms in an environment are consumed by another. Plants and phytoplankton are always, or are almost always, the producers who are at the bottom of the food web because they take energy in the form of from their environment and can produce their own food, usually in the form of photosynthesis. Bacteria are an incredibly diverse group of prokaryotes that are found in virtually every corner of the earth. Only a few cause disease in humans, so it would be inaccurate to define them as organisms that cause disease. Biochemistry is the overlapping study of chemistry and biology. Much of biology is founded on chemistry. In fact, I would go so far as to say in order to fully understand biology, you need to have a solid background in chemistry. All of the biochemistry that we know about on Earth is reliant on the element carbon, so it revolves around carbon, and it also revolves around liquid water as a solvent. Together, cell biology, evolution, genetics, ecology, anatomy and physiology, uh, and biochemistry serve as the main pillars of the study of biology. Metamorphosis is the process by which many organisms seemingly abruptly change their body plans as they grow over time. The ones that you probably know about are tadpoles turning into frogs and caterpillars turning into butterflies, although there are a lot more if you delve into the world of biology. Vaccines are chemical formulations that when injected or consumed into an organism allow for that organism's immune system to become exposed to what's called a pathogen, a foreign substance or an organism that is capable of causing disease. They are a hugely important part of modern medicine and they have no proven link to any other diseases, especially not autism, so they're incredibly safe to use. By the way, while we're on the topic of vaccines, I want to talk about two words that will come up a lot in this video. They are antigen and antibody. Antigens are proteins that pathogens have that your body can detect and signal for some kind of immune response. Antibodies are special Y-shaped proteins, uh, or they're not actually Y-shaped, but like on diagrams are the things that look like Ys that your body produces, uh, and each antibody is very specifically shaped to bind to a certain antigen, so that's how your body can recognize what kind of disease it has. 
Cancer is a group of diseases that are characterized by the rapid, uncontrolled division of cells into masses called tumors. There are many different kind of, kinds of cancers depending on what kinds of organs they are forming in and how they behave. So that was tier 1 of the iceberg, things that almost everyone has heard about at some point in their lives. We are now moving on to tier 2, which is more in-depth, and you've probably heard of most or all of these things, but uh, without a background in biology, maybe not know much about them. Things that you might have learned in elementary or middle or high school. Central dogma is one of the most, if not the most important uh, ideas in biology. It states that your DNA is transcribed uh, into another nucleic acid that we already talked about, RNA. And that RNA is translated into an amino acid sequence. What are amino acids? They are the individual components of proteins. And that amino acid sequence determines the shape of the protein, and the shape of the protein is what determines its function. This is why when there is a mutation or a change in the DNA, it can result in a change in the shape of a protein, which results in a change in your cells, which results in a change in an organism. This is one of the most important ideas in all of biology, and I will be referencing this DNA to RNA transcription and RNA to protein translation a lot in this video. DNA replication is the process by which DNA molecules are duplicated within cells. Errors in DNA replication, so mutations, can result in new genetic diversity or have detrimental impacts like cancer. Bioluminescence is the biochemical process by which organisms can produce their own light. Uh, normally, it is found in insects or in the deep seas. Viruses are biological structures composed of a protein coat surrounding their genetic material. So it can be DNA or RNA, and they need to hijack cells in order to survive and reproduce. Because they require another organism's cells to reproduce, they are often not considered alive there's still some disagreement as to whether or not they fit the definition of life. Mendelian genetics refers to the system proposed by Austrian scientist and friar Gregor Mendel, in which, to put it extremely simply, traits such as height and color, Mendel actually did his work on pea plants, so that's what he was looking at, are governed by forms called alleles. One allele will be dominant and one will be recessive, each organism will inherit one allele from each parent, and if it inherits a dominant and recessive allele, uh, it will express the dominant form of the trait because the dominant one uh, masks the recessive. For now, let's just say that even though this is what we teach everyone middle school onward, it is a huge oversimplification of real life. It is not the full truth by a long shot. However, Mendel did supplant prior biological theories that offspring were just blends of their parents. Fine squares are diagrams which allow for the prediction of inheritance patterns based on Mendel's genetics. So for traits that follow simple Mendelian inheritance, they are incredibly useful. X and Y chromosomes are the sex-determining chromosomes in humans. If you have two X chromosomes, it is generally said that you are biologically female. Uh, if you have an X and a Y chromosome, we call that male. Uh, this is a huge oversimplification of real life, and we will get back to this much later on in the iceberg. Mitosis and meiosis are the processes by which genetic material is uh, divided between uh, multiple daughter cells during cell division. In most cells, the process is mitosis, uh, so identical copies of duplicated genetic material are split between two daughter cells. You probably know the stages from elementary or uh, middle school, so there is, pro uh, I like to do this hand motion, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. In sex cells, so in humans, the eggs and the sperm, you want genetic diversity in each of the four, four daughter cells. Uh, and so it will actually involve the division of duplicated genetic material twice, so that each, uh, each sex cell has half of the DNA that would be required to form a full human organism. So it, it, it's kind of like, uh, so this process is called meiosis, it's kind of like doing mitosis Twice, that's not exactly true, but you can think about it as such. When one egg and one sperm meet, 
uh, half of the DNA comes from the egg and half comes from the sperm and together you can have a, a fertilized egg which will duplicate into an embryo after many duplications I should say. This is also the basis for the dominant and the recessive alleles that Mendel observed but he had no idea what mitosis and meiosis were. He had no idea what DNA was actually. The biological macromolecules molecules are the four main classes of large molecules that form the center of biology. So most of them are long chains called polymer, pol, 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 polymers com, uh, composed of individual units called monomers. Put very simply and briefly, they, the four of them are number one, carbohydrates composed of uh, what we would normally call simple sugars. It's a huge oversimplification, but let's move on. Uh, lipids, which actually do not always form definitive polymers, but the main ones you are familiar with are fat and cholesterol. Proteins, which are composed of amino acids, and nucleic acids, which are composed of nucleotides. Symbiosis is interaction between organisms that benefit one, at least one party. They are generally divided into mutualism, so when two organisms, both parties, benefit, so think of like sharks and remoras, commensalism in which one partner benefits and the other kind of doesn't really get anything out of it, and most notoriously parasitism in which one partner benefits and the other is actively harmed. We will see some weird parasites moving on. Osmosis is the diffusion of water from regions of high to low solute concentration. Keep in mind that uh, in general diffusion happens across any kind of semi-permeable membrane and the particles will always move from high to low concentration if there is no extra energy put into it. The same is true for heat and if you're an engineer or study uh, raw physical chemistry you will be familiar with heat flow. Active transport refers to any transport across a cell membrane that requires outside energy. Osmosis is not considered active transport. Any kind of diffusion along a concentration gradient is not active transport. It can move things against their gradient, however. Cloning is the artificial process in which scientists can generate exact copies of cells or living things, and the most famous example is Dolly the Sheep. Aposematism is coloring in organisms that sends warning signs telling predators that they are toxic or dangerous. Gecko feet refer to a very commonly taught fact in biology which uh, states that on their feet geckos have microscopic structures called setae which allow them to perfectly cling onto surfaces. And this is actually done by using the weakest of what are called the intermolecular forces, the van der Waals force. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate which is actually the main energy currency of life. If you break, so if you look at this, this diagram, if you see the uh, red lines that are connecting the P and the O, so uh, each of those green circles represents a phosphate, hence the triphosphate. If you break that red line, that bond, releasing a phosphate, uh, that will release a lot of energy, and the release of that energy is what powers most of your cellular machinery in your body. Clades refer to biological classifications based on common ancestry. There is no definitive list of hierarchies distinguishing uh, clades from one another, and it can also account for transitional forms between uh, within evolutionary transitions. Uh, that makes it much more useful for scientists than Linnaean taxonomy when discussing evolutionary relationships. Cellular respiration refers to the biochemical process, or rather series of biochemical processes, by which cells can convert glucose, the uh, simple sugar, into chemical energy in the form of ATP. It's divided into four steps, first glycolysis, then pyruvate oxidation, the Krebs or citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation, sometimes called the electron transport chain. Uh, it's not to be confused with the respiration in your lungs. Without oxygen, only glycolysis can occur. The final three steps require oxygen, and they happen in, you guessed it, the powerhouse of the cell, mitochondria. Rosalind Franklin was the scientist who discovered the double helix structure of DNA. Her work was stolen from her by a pair of male scientists who received the full credit for the discovery. 
she actually did not receive much credit until after her untimely death to cancer, which may have been egged on by the fact that she was working a lot with x-rays to determine the structure of DNA. Other human species refers to the other species of apes that would probably be considered human. They're in the genus Homo uh, that have since gone extinct. You may have heard of Homo erectus, Homo habilis, and almost definitely Neanderthals. However, we are constantly discovering new species like Homo luzonensis, which was found in the Philippines, Homo floresiensis, which is actually from the island of Flores in Indonesia and was a very small uh, species of human to the point where some have nicknamed it the real-life hobbit, and Homo denisova. In the case of Neanderthals and Denisovans, there is ample evidence to suggest that we bred with them and actually Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA still exists in many human populations. Melanin is the pigment, or more accurately, the class of pigments that gives human skin and hair their color. Melanin is produced in higher concentrations in skin cells of people who live closer to the equator because darker skin can help block UV radiation from the sun, thus preventing skin cancer. Whale communication refers to the fact that whales have complex vocal languages that include songs, and they're characterized by their repeating patterns, hence why scientists have called them whale songs. These sounds are incredibly diverse and can carry on for miles under the ocean. They are a relatively well-studied example of animal communication being far more advanced than we previously thought. So you've almost definitely heard of RNA vaccines if you lived through the COVID-19 pandemic. Unlike traditional vaccines, so traditional vaccines will contain a weakened version of the pathogen that gets injected into the body that your body can train on. Uh, RNA vaccines contain the pathogen's RNA, or more specifically, RNA that codes for the antigen that your body can recognize. The RNA becomes translated in your body's cells into proteins, which your body can then recognize as the antigen and train on. So remember that vaccines don't cure diseases, they allow your body to recognize the disease in the future. They are an incredibly safe and effective and fantastic example of the applications of biology in engineering. And the fact that they were engineered so quickly when the COVID-19 pandemic was at its height is a an absolutely incredible feat of biology. We are now entering tier 3 of the iceberg, so now we are going to go into the realm of things that most people may have heard of at some point in their lives, but now I'll be introducing you to topics in biology that are a little bit more complicated. If you've studied biology at all in college, um, mainly introductory classes of biology, but uh, generally higher than what you would learn in uh, regular school, at least in the United States, I'm not sure about other countries, but at, in, in uh, elementary middle school, uh, you might be familiar with most of these. But brain lobes refer to a specific set of divisions within a certain part of the brain the part most responsible for complex cognition, the cerebral cortex. The human brain is a, an incredibly complex organ. It's divided into three main parts, the hindbrain, midbrain, and forebrain. And the forebrain is where most of your central processing is going to happen. Uh, as I said, the most complicated part is the cerebral cortex, but it's further divided into the frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal lobes. If you ever have to memorize them, uh, I like the mnemonic FPOT. The frontal lobe kind of serves as your here kind of serves as your body's control center and supervisor and it's responsible for a lot of your behavior and executive function. The parietal lobes of that kind of back here is going to determine a lot of how you feel touch and pain. The occipital lobe in the back deals with vision and the temporal lobe to the side deals with hearing. I know I'm skipping about 90% of the brain's anatomy. It's in incredibly interesting, uh, but we'd be here all day. We could actually do a whole iceberg on neuroscience if we really, really wanted to, but we will come back to neuroscience later on. Archaea are a domain of prokaryotic life that are actually much more closely related to eukaryotes than they are to bacteria. However, they are still unicellular and they are, if you've probably heard of them, you've probably heard of them in the context of them being extremophiles, meaning they can be found in some of the most extreme environments known to humanity. Think hot springs or the bottom of the ocean floor. That's not to say that all archaea are found in extreme habitats, but that is where they were first identified. 
Fermentation is an alternate pathway to produce ATP in the absence of oxygen. In our cells, lactic acid fermentation is performed, and it's also the kind of fermentation that will give you kimchi and sauerkraut among other things. Yeast and plants can perform alcohol fermentation, which yes, is where drinking alcohol comes from. Antibiotic resistance refers to the modern phenomenon in which bacteria are rapidly evolving resistance to our antibiotic drugs. This is why you should always finish your dose of antibiotics, just in case there are any bacteria that survive your antibiotics regimen and end up passing down genes that allow future generations of bacteria to be resistant to that drug. Uh, also, antibiotics are not a cure-all for disease. They target bacteria, specific species of bacteria. Uh, antivirals are needed to cure a viral infection, but antivirals do not work on bacteria, and antibiotics do not work on viruses. Stem cells refer to cells which have not yet differentiated into specific cell types. Most, cell, most stem cells, I should say, are pluripotent, meaning that they can become any cell except those in the placenta. Or they are multipotent, which means that they can become any cell within a specific group. So think if a, a multipotent uh, stem cell for blood could probably become any blood cell, but it can't, say, become a skin cell or a brain cell. The only totipotent... The only totipotent... The only totipotent stem cells that we generally talk about are found in embryos, in spores in plants, like inside seeds. Uh, they can become any cell that that species has. Bacterial culturing refers to the lab technique of growing bacteria on nutrient-rich media for study. Due to COVID, I was not able to do cell bio lab in person. It's kind of sad. Uh, but I was able to do bacterial cell culturing two times in my life. That's so sad, only twice. Two times in my life, once when I was in high school trying to test an antibiotic nanoparticle formulation I was trying to make. It did not work. And once for a more advanced college class in which my lab partner and I were trying to clone a gene that we isolated from a sage plant. Enzymes are special proteins that can catalyze chemical reactions. They are the workhorses of all life on Earth. There are so many different enzymes that do so many different reactions and they are incredibly important if you want to understand biology. They have special regions called active sites that bind so very selectively to certain molecules and that allows them to perform their functions very selectively and efficiently. Gel electrophoresis refers to a very common biological lab technique in which DNA fragments are separated by their size. The fun fact is that DNA is actually negatively charged, so if you load it into what's called a gel and uh, pass an electric current through it, the DNA will actually move toward the positive electron. And the speed at which it moves through the gel, so the gel is very porous, but it's kind of like an obstacle course. So uh, if DNA fragments are smaller, they have an easier time passing through the little obstacles that are in the gel. And if they're larger, they're gonna have a harder time. So the speed at which the fragment moves is very dependent on the fragment's size. So once you turn off the current, you can actually see where each fragment of DNA ended up and the larger it is the closer it will be to the starting point and the smaller it is the further away it will be. This allows you to quantify the size of a specific DNA fragment and if you're very clever with the application allows you to actually isolate specific genes. If you want to separate proteins by their size you can perform a modified gel electrophoresis it's called SDS page but you need to treat it with a detergent first SDS in order to give the entire protein a uniform uh, charge because unlike DNA protein is not always negatively charged. PCR is the extremely important lab technique in which a fragment of DNA can be replicated over the course of several cycles artificially resulting in an increase of that DNA fragment over 1 billion times. This is an extremely important lab technique in genetics and forensic analysis and it relies on a very careful control of temperature, so cycling temperatures to uh, br uh, separ separate and bring together the uh, DNA strands. And it also relies on a heat resistant enzyme called TAC polymerase, isolated from a bacteria found in the hot springs of Yellowstone National Park. I just realized I never 
said what PCR stands for. Did I say what it stands for? Polymerase chain reaction, that's what PCR stands for. Sarcomeres refer to the microscopic units that make up your skeletal, skeletal muscle cells. When muscles contract, actually your skeletal muscles contract, so I think like your, your bicep, your tricep, I have no muscles. When your skeletal muscles contract, it is actually thousands of uh, these units, these sarcomeres contracting. We're not going to go into exactly how this multi-stage contraction process works, just like how we're not going into any of these processes in depth, but uh, suffice to say, it involves the pull of filaments of a thicker protein called myosin by a thinner protein called actin, and it requires calcium ions. Next time you're at the gym, just think about all the sarcomeres you're contracting. Glucose polymers refer to the different ways in which glucose can polymerize. There are actually two main forms of glucose. They are the alpha and beta conformations, and they are determined by, if you look at this diagram, you see the that OH at the far right of each of these glucose structures. Rather, that's what glucose actually looks like. It's the chair conformation of glucose. You can see that one of the OHs is pointing down in uh, the alpha form and one of them is pointing up called the beta form this may seem like it's completely arbitrary at first but it actually plays a role in the kinds of polymers that that glucose forms specifically how strong that polymer is side note if you're pre-med or studying biochemistry uh, these are called the enamers of glucose and uh, to interconvert between them that is called mutarotation which is just such a fun word to say mutarotation in animals, long polymers of this glucose are stored in the liver as glycogen. Uh, plants can actually have two forms, depending on if they're storing the alpha or beta forms. Uh, if the alpha form polymerizes, it is going to form starch, so the thing that you see in rice, wheat, and barley. But beta polymerization, so if the beta form polymerizes, that's called cellulose. You can digest starch, as you can imagine, but not cellulose. Uh, you've definitely seen cellulose before. It's the structural component of any plant that you see. And in the nutrition facts label, it's called fiber. Hemoglobin is the protein in your red blood cells, and it is responsible for binding onto oxygen and transporting it throughout the body. It's kind of like a booster seat where it's carrying the oxygen. Carbon monoxide, which you may know about, it's, is the silent killer. It's an incredibly toxic chemical that you cannot see, cannot smell, cannot taste. It actually binds to hemoglobin more strongly than oxygen, which is how it suffocates you. I'm gonna think about it. I should re rename this to hemoglobin, to oxygen versus carbon monoxide, but I'm kind of too lazy to change the iceberg now. I already made it. Predator prey cycles refer to a general observation in ecology in which predator and prey populations fluctuate in predictable patterns. When predator populations rise, the prey that they eat are eaten more, and so their population will decrease. However, as the prey populations decrease, the predators will begin to lose their food supply, and so their population will start to decrease as well. As the predator population decreases, the prey are preyed on less, as you can imagine, and their population will rebound and go up, and as a result of there being more food, the predator population will start to rise and the cycle, completes, uh, cycle repeats itself over and over again. The most notable example of this was in the 1970s at Isle Royale National Park involving uh, moose and wolves. Non-Mendelian inheritance refers to more complex inheritance patterns which either defy Gregor Mendel's genetics or are advanced modifications of it. The more common ones that students will learn about are incomplete dominance, so uh, think of the blending of two traits, co-dominance in which two traits will be equally represented, epistasis in which one gene can mask the other. This is one that I usually find it hard to teach, but the key example that we teach are uh, Labrador colors. Convergent evolution refers to multiple lineages of organisms evolving similar traits without sharing a common ancestor that has that particular trait. Uh, this is often because different lineages live in separated environments, but those traits would prove advantageous. So think about fish, dolphins, uh, and ichthyosaurs all evolving similar 
body plans, kind of. But uh, if you're good with anatomy, you can spot differences between them that allow you to determine that that kind of form evolved as a result of convergent evolution and not common ancestry. There are also other weird examples of snails forming, evolving that same kind of fish body plan. But anyway, going off, I'm gonna go on so many tangents later on in this ice. Biomagnification refers to the increase in concentration of pollutants and chemicals in bodies as you move up a food chain. Plants and prey animals are exposed to relatively small amounts of pollution each when they take in nutrients from their environment, but predators eat a lot of prey. And so these pollutants from each prey item they consume become concentrated in their bodies. This is why shark and swordfish meat, these are apex predators of the ocean, is generally a lot higher in mercury than other fish and is sometimes considered not safe to eat. Nitrogen fixation is the biochemical process by which nitrogen gas in the air, by the way the most common gas in the air, is converted by special nitrogen fixing bacteria into uh, nitrates, which is a form of nitrogen that can be used by plants. It's an essential process for life to function and relies on special bacteria which, fun fact, they actually love to live in the nodes of the roots of beans and legumes. So ancient American farmers would actually plant a variety of crops together with the beans in order to maximize the nutrients in the soil. These were called milpas. They didn't actually know about nitrogen, or at least I don't know. There's no way they could have known about the chemical nitrogen, but I guess they just observed that legumes had this effect on their crop yields, which is a really cool example of indigenous knowledge. Alisas, which stands for enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, is a laboratory technique that is used to detect substances, usually proteins, which works really well on. In a direct ELISA, a sample is exposed to its corresponding antibody. So remember, we said that antibodies can selectively bind to antigens. So that binding in an ELISA will cause some kind of signal. Usually a color change is kind of the simplest one. There are also other kinds of ELISAs, the indirect, the sandwich, and the competitive, which we will not be going into here. Cas9 is a relatively recent and revolutionary technology that allows for precise genome editing using a pair of molecular scissors called Cas9. Uh, as with the other topics here, we will not be going in depth into this uh, relatively complicated biochemical process, but needless to say, it is a revolutionary leap in genetics and gene editing. We're not going to go into GMOs in this iceberg, but this is an extremely important tool for editing genomes. There is a reason it's the only biotechnology besides the mRNA vaccines that has made headlines recently in popular news. Abiogenesis refers to the theory that life emerged from non-living molecules billions of years ago when the Earth was still young. In the 1950s, there was an experiment called the Miller-Urey experiment that demonstrated that the early Earth had the right chemistry and the right environment to produce these organic compounds naturally, including amino acids. In fact, when Miller died in 2007, I think he the samples he produced had were opened up and they had even more diverse compounds than what he originally found. The exact mechanisms by which these compounds can become living things is actually unknown at the time of the making of this video, but there, the general scientific consensus is that life emerged from non-life. By the way, while we're here, when we say theory in science, theories in science are actually facts. They're models that we use to explain the world around us. So the theory of evolution, theory of abiogenesis, theory of gravity, theory of relativity, they're all correct. The way we use theory in day-to-day -day life as like a guess, uh, that's not how we use it in science. Theories are models and they are all, they are facts. The electron transport chain is the biochemical system that allows electrons to be passed along, along a membrane. The most well-known examples of the electron transport chain are on the inner mitochondrial membrane, that's the last step of cellular respiration, and on the membrane of a structure in photosynthesizing cells called a thylakoid. So on the thylakoid membrane inside the chloroplast, there's also an electron transport chain there. For the longest time, I was actually really confused about how this worked, like how does the electron know which direction to go, and involves a thing in chemistry that we learned about called reduction potential. Uh, it wasn't until I connected those, I know, it, 
a lot of people in youth from the beginning, but it wasn't until I connected those dots that it finally started to make sense to me. Essentially, you can kind of think of this as a game of electronic hot potato, in which electrons are passed down from structure to structure, like a game of hot potato, until the structure that wants it most receives it at the end. In the case of most electron transport chains that you will ever learn about in your life, the thing that wants that electron most is oxygen, which is why you need oxygen to breathe in order to produce uh, the massive amounts of ATP at the end of the electron transport chain. Endosymbiont theory is the theory that mitochondria and chloroplasts, along with a few other organelles, are actually descended from prokaryotes that were ingested by early precursors to the eukaryotes billions of years ago. This is demonstrated by the fact that mitochondria have their own DNA and their ribosomes, and that DNA and ribosomes are actually distinct from the rest of our DNA. We are now moving on to tier 4 of the iceberg. We are now fully in the realm of college level biology and <clears throat> pre-meds. There's going to be a lot of pre-med medical stuff in this tier, so yeah, if you're into that, I hope you enjoy this part. Protists are a catch-all term for a, a kingdom of life. It's a catch-all kingdom that includes all eukaryotes that are not plants, animals, or fungi. It, has, it is not based on common ancestry. We used to think it was, but now we know that it's way too diverse for that. So because it's not based on common ancestry, it's not super useful to us. It's kind of just like a, a dumpster bin for anything that's not a plant, animal, or fungus, but it is still a eukaryote. Uh, in this category are slime molds, many algae, and amoebas, uh, but that's just a tiny fraction of the organisms that were once considered protists. The Cambrian explosion refers to a massive boom in animal biodiversity approximately 540 million years ago. During this boom, uh, which happened over the course of a few million years, all of the major animal phyla that we have in the world today appear in the fossil record. The causes of it are not well known, but there are many hypotheses including, among other things, rising oxygen levels, an evolutionary arms race, and an increase of calcium in the ocean, which is interesting because calcium is uh, necessary for the formation of, far of harder body parts in a lot of animals, specifically bones and shells. Some of the most notable animals from this time are the trilobites, which emerge at this time but continue throughout the Paleozoic, uh, Animalocaris, which was one of the, if not the earliest, known apex predators, Opobinia, which had five eyes, and Hallucigenia, which, which kind of looked like it had both spikes and nubs, and for the longest time we actually had it upside down, or we thought it walked on those nubs when it actually walked on its what we, what we now call the spikes, or what we used to call the spikes. A lot of weird things existed during the, the Cambrian period. Opioids are a class of chemicals that act on opioid receptors to inhibit pain. Opioid receptors in your body are incredibly useful parts of your nervous system because they are involved in pain sensitivity, anxiety, gut regulation, and feelings of euphoria. So if an opioid binds to a receptor, it can cause pain relief or have an anesthetic effect. The most famous opioid is morphine, but they also include oxycodone codeine, and the highly addictive fentanyl, heroin, and methadone. The drug naloxone, which is sold, uh, sold as Narcan, can prevent overdose by binding to the opioid receptor instead of the opioid. Uh, so uh, during an overdose, it kind of acts like a game of molecular musical chairs. Uh, so the, uh, the naloxone is actually beating the opioid to that chair, the chair being the receptor. Uh, and that, that's called competitive inhibition. It's the basis of a lot of the enzyme biology that you will learn about. I felt the need to go a little bit more in depth there with the naloxone because we are living through an opioid epidemic if you're in the United States right now. Hypnotropism is the ability for a plant to grow in a specific direction in response to touch. So if you've ever uh, worked with vines, this is how they're able to climb, 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 climb stalks. The michaelis menten equation is a model that allows for the prediction of enzyme velocity. So enzyme velocity is the rate at which an enzyme can catalyze the molecule that it's acting on, called a substrate. And I hate this question. I, I hate this equation. Okay, I hate I hate this equation. I hate math and biophysics. Get this get this shit out. Of here. I know it's important in biophysics, but get get it out of here. 
don't worry. If you study biophysics and you don't like Michaela's Menton math, it gets worse. Foster's Rule is a biological phenomenon in which species evolve to become larger or smaller depending on what resources are available around them. It's uh, very evident in islands. So in scarce resources, which can happen in islands, organisms will become sm will evolve to be smaller over time so that they require fewer resources. In abundance, which can also happen on islands, they become larger because there's more resources for them. Examples of shrinking on islands called island dwarfism include prehistoric pygmy elephants that were found on the islands of Sicily and Crete, uh, and even prehistoric humans. So remember the Homo floresiensis we brought up earlier, the, the real-life hobbits. Uh, examples of island gigantism are numerous, and many of them are still around to date, like the Komodo dragon. Uh, but also the prehistoric elephant birds and moas, the giant birds that existed in, you know, uh, elephant birds in Madagascar, moas in New Zealand. Actually, the, this stork in the diagram is not an elephant bird or a moa. It's actually a giant stork that used to exist in prehistoric Indonesia. One of my favorite modern examples of island gigantism are the giant spiny rats of Southeast Asia. I, my friends and I saw them at the Bronx Zoo once we were like looking for them in the exhibit and when we finally saw it it's it's huge it's it's the Luzon clouded rat it's, it's gigantic one of the weirdest animals of the Philippines in my opinion. circulation involves the path in which blood flows throughout the body the reason this is kind of so low is because I often see people getting confused as to what arteries and veins are. They'll say that arteries carry oxygenated blood and veins carry deoxygenated blood. By the way, they're not actually red and blue. I hope I don't have to say that. But this is half true. Arteries carry oxygenated blood away from the heart toward the organs and uh, the gas exchange happens in tiny blood vessels called the capillaries. And then the deoxygenated blood, once it's, the oxygen has been taken up by the organs and the tissues is carried by the veins back into the heart. However, there are also pulmonary arteries which carry deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs, and so it's actually in the lungs where they refill on the oxygen, and then the pulmonary veins carry that oxygenated blood from the lungs back into the heart. So there's systemic circulation and there's pulmonary circulation. The systemic circulation distributes oxygen throughout the tissues in your body. The pulmonary circulation refills on the oxygen. So the fully accurate statement is that arteries carry blood away from the heart and veins carry them toward the heart. Uh, this is true in every case. Also, um, side note, so when I was compiling my notes, I got a little carried away because um, I went on a tangent. I was trying to figure out why plaques build up in arteries but not veins. And so there were a lot of articles online that were saying that it was because arteries have a higher blood pressure, which is true. Uh, the, if you think about the heart, is a pump, 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 that, uh, and it, blood flows to the arteries first, and so the arteries are exposed to all that pressure, whereas veins are not exposed to that kind of pressure. Uh, but uh, none of these sources really seemed that reliable, and also none of them were really doing a good job of explaining. Actually, very few of them even attempted to explain why this was, or they were very poorly cited. So I went down the citation rabbit hole on Wikipedia and I tried to get access to different papers because they also kept on saying things like pressure and it's hard to find an explanation. Uh, I am not a, I am not a doctor. I am not a doctor. I'm sure there are so many doctors who know the answer to this. I'm not a doctor at all. But uh, yes, in short, part of the answer that I was able to find it has to do with pressure. The higher pressure in arteries can actually affect the development of the smooth muscle on the arterial wall and that has an effect on uh, the formation of atherosclerosis which is these, uh, uh, the buildup of atheroma which is the scientific name for these plaques. Uh, the pressure also leads to signaling differences involving the immune system and the accumulation of immune cells is actually important in the formation of these plaques. So yes, I will put a lot of papers in the description that I, I'm terrible at reading papers. I will be honest. I looked at the abstracts and went to uh, controlled F, 
control F for the relevant section in the paper. What a rabbit hole. Let's just move on. Nerves are the long cells that send signals uh, up and down the spinal cord uh, to the brain or toward the what's called the peripheral nervous system so that it allows you to feel and interact with your environment. They relay signals by conducting an electrical charge, kind of like a wire along the long, the long parts of their uh, body called axons. The conduction of this charge is sped up by a layer of lipids called a myelin sheath and it lines the axon kind of like beads on a thread, uh, meaning that the positive charges that are carrying that charge, in this case positive sodium and potassium ions, uh, when they carry the charge they must move to the next part of the axon that is not protected by the myelin sheath and those regions where they can uh, be exchanged in and out of the axon that's called the nodes of Ranvier. And this sped up conduction is called saltatory conduction. At the end of the axon, the signal then gets relayed onto the next nerve cell at a junction called the synapse, where a chemical called a neurotransmitter is released. So this is where you've probably heard of uh, neurotransmitters. The type and amount of the neurotransmitter that is released will determine what kind of signal gets propagated onto the next nerve cell. Flatworms refer to an extremely diverse of simple worms that have no body cavity. One group of flatworms called the pr 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 planarians, planarians are notorious for their regenerative abilities. If you cut them at any point, they will regenerate their bodies. If you split them halfway, you end up with two planarians. In this case, it was split into, in the picture here, it was split into three parts. You got three planarians. And this is due to their pluripotent stem cells. Mass extinction refers to any event in the history of life on Earth in which a large fraction of species went extinct within a relatively short amount of time. And by relatively short amount of time, I mean several million years. There are many mass extinctions in history, usually marking the end of a geologic period. But as far as animals are concerned, there are five big ones. The late Ordovician around 450 million years ago, the late Devonian around 370 million years ago, something like that. The Permian Great Dying, in which 90 something, 96% of all life went extinct about 252 million years ago. The late Triassic, around 200 million years ago. And of course, the KPG mass extinction, which killed off the non avian dinosaurs around 65 million years ago. There is some debate as to whether or not we are currently living through a mass extinction caused by human destruction of the environment and climate change. If so, this would be by far the fastest of the mass extinction as it's not happening over the course of millions of years, but rather hundreds. And actually, faster than that if you really think about it. Small nuclear ribonucleoproteins, pronounced SNRPs. Yes, SNRPs. These are RNA protein complexes that can cut out segments of non-coding RNA that come from non-coding segments of DNA called introns and depending on which segments of RNA get removed it can result in different amino acid sequences from the same DNA sequence so this is called alternative splicing and it, and it allows for a lot of diversity within uh, a lot of diversity of proteins produced from a small amount of DNA actually it's it's part of why it's BS to think about junk DNA. Uh, just because DNA does not code for a protein, it doesn't mean it's useless. It can have other functions here. Photosynthesizing animals refers to the fact that many animals are actually capable of consuming the chloroplasts in plants and algae and actually store them to perform photosynthesis in their own bodies. And the, probably the most famous example of this is the green sea slug, which literally looks like a leaf. Uh, and it shows that biology is full of exceptions. Epigenetics is the study of environmental changes to genes. There are many, many levels of epigenetics, such as the literal silencing of DNA by forcing it into tighter coils around uh, proteins called histones. Uh, you can also prevent the RNA polymerase from being able to transcribe the DNA with this method. Or you can have certain RNA sequences that bind to DNA to prevent it from being read. Epigenetics is a whole wild field of study that shows just how complicated and interesting genetics is. The microbiome refers to the fact that all, virtually all multicellular life as we know it, exists in symbiotic relationship 
with billions of bacteria, archaea, and fungi that live on and in them. 70 to 90% of the cells in your body, yes, you, your body, yeah, they're microbial. They're not human cells, mostly on your skin and in your gut. In your gut, especially your gut, is mostly bacterial, fungi, and archaea cells. The microbiome has been linked to everything from cancer to human behavior. So yeah, it's extremely important. HeLa cells refer to the stem cells of an African-American cervical cancer patient named Henrietta Lacks, whose cervical cells were harvested without her consent in 1951. Lacks's cancer cells were particularly prolific and have since been immortalized, meaning that uh, in their, under lab conditions they can develop divide indefinitely and they've been used very very heavily in research while they're far from the only immortalized cell line hela cells are notable because of their widespread use in research but they also serve as a really good case study on informed consent in research actually just as i was recording this i found out that there was a very recently filed lawsuit by the lax estate suing chemical company thermo fisher for using her cells which good 7-Up refers to a mnemonic by which you can remember the path that sperm takes out of the human body before it's released during ejaculation. So the S is for uh, seminiferous tubules, then to the epididymis, the vas deferens, the ejaculatory ducts, the N actually stands for nothing, this is kind of like a blank space, uh, the urethra, and then finally out of the penis. So I'm putting menstruation on this iceberg and also this low because in the United States, at least, we're kind of living at a time in which state governments especially are very dangerously pushing for restrictions on the reproductive rights of people who give birth and menstruate, which is mostly but not limited to cisgender women. And sex ed in the United States is so poor, dangerously poor. Uh, so I wanted to talk briefly about what the menstrual cycle is. not that in depth because there are better videos and more qualified people than me to talk about it uh, but very briefly because a lot of especially a lot of men have no idea what this uh, what, what menstruation is and in fact a lot of women also don't really understand it very well uh, briefly the menstrual cycle is actually a combination of two biological cycles there is the ovarian cycle which is uh, going to surround the egg cell and the uterine cycle which uh, centers around the lining of the uterus called the endometrium. During the first 14 days of the ovarian cycle, which we call the follicular phase, uh, the egg is going to develop inside a structure called a follicle inside the ovaries. During this time, the uterine cycle is also undergoing its first stage in which the lining of the uterus, so remember the endometrium, will thicken. And this is in preparation for the possibility of the egg to get fertilized by sperm. This thickening is governed by a hormone that you might know, estrogen. In the next 14 days, uh, the follicle will release the egg, and this process is called ovulation. And it will travel down the fallopian down the fallopian tube toward the uterus and this uh, 14 day stage the second 14 day stage is called the luteal cycle this leaves behind a mass of cells which is the corpus luteum and it can secrete the hormone progesterone when the egg finally does reach the uterus if there has been no fertilization it is uh, going to be shed out along with the uterine lining and this is where menstruation comes this is where uh uh, colloquially you get the period. It is usually accompanied by mood changes especially because the shedding of the lining can be extremely painful but also because it's accompanied by a large fluctuation in different hormones. Uh, estrogen, gonadotropin releasing hormone, uh, luteinizing hormone, progesterone, uh, and follicle stimulating hormone. If the egg has been fertilized by sperm, the progesterone levels will remain uh, elevated and uh, as the fertilized egg gets implanted into the uterus, the pregnancy can occur. I should also note that even though this is the cycle that we learn about, uh, it does not usually follow the exact 28-day time period. Um, many people have irregular periods, 
and all of these processes are perfectly normal, regulated by hormones, and absolutely nothing that should be regulated by laws. Birth control pills are extremely important. They work by interfering with these hormones, which is why if someone is having issues with, say, acne or cramps that are also regulated by the hormones, they may be taking birth control as well. I should also note that periods can arrive late or even be skipped due to one of any different environmental factors like stress, age, or trauma, which can cause the period to be delayed or skip. It's not indicative of a pregnancy. It can be several weeks before a birthing person knows that they are pregnant, which is why the next time you see anyone calling for a six-week abortion ban. Yeah, that's... I mean, abortion bans in general are already extremely dangerous, but uh, it just goes to show not only how many dangerous people are in power who seek to impose their beliefs on natural biological functions, uh, but also people who follow them who don't genuinely seem to not know the basic, a lot of this basic biology that people go through their entire lives. And if it sounds like I'm bringing up something that's not related to biology, biology is very closely intertwined with our society and understanding of these mechanisms and the applications of biology has real social, economic, and political implications. Vitamin D is a vitamin that is important in the absorption of minerals, especially calcium, which is why it is so important for bone growth. If you ever hear that somebody needs sunlight for their vitamin D, it's actually because vitamin D is synthesized on the, on the skin. So UV radiation from the sun hits a chemical called 7-dehydrocholesterol, which then gets converted into the precursors for vitamin D. There are actually a lot of reactions in chemistry and biology that use UV light because high energy radiation is very useful in breaking chemical bonds. Methanol poisoning. Uh, so this refers to the fact that methanol, the simplest kind of alcohol, is incredibly toxic. The alcohol that is normally consumed is ethanol, which is only mildly toxic. Your body has an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase that breaks down alcohols and prevents alcohol poisoning in the body. If you drink too much ethanol and your body can't handle it, it will treat it like any other toxin and force you to vomit. Methanol is extremely dangerous and can cause permanent blindness with as little as 10 milliliters. 10 milliliters. It wreaks havoc on your central nervous system and uh, if that's not bad enough, the alcohol dehydrogenase will try to metabolize it and it will end up producing formaldehyde which you may or may not have heard of but it is embalming fluid basically. Yeah, embalming fluid. Historically, there have been cases of people attempting to make their own alcohol and end up producing some methanol by accident, resulting in methanol poisoning. However, if we use our bio-knowledge, specifically remember the uh, competitive inhibition from the opioid, uh, opioid entry, where we have our biological musical chairs, we can kind of devise a homemade remedy for methanol poisoning. Uh, doctors figured out that if you give a person suffering from methanol poisoning more ethanol, so more liquor. The ethanol may displace some of that methanol, uh, competing with it for those slots of alcohol dehydrogenase, and thus prevent the metabolism of uh, methanol into formaldehyde. So yeah, if you are poisoned with methanol, the cure that doctors are able to come up with was to get their patient more drunk. Innate and adaptive immunity refers to the two levels at which your immune system works to stop disease. Briefly, your innate immunity is not specific to any one pathogen and involves things like the macrophages and special antibiotic proteins in your skin and saliva. Yes, you have antibiotic proteins in your skin and saliva. The adaptive immunity is your body responding to very specific pathogens, so think about antibodies. Operons are groups of genes that are uh, controlled and get transcribed together. They are generally very tightly regulated by a sequence of DNA called a promoter at their start and are an example of gene regulation. 
they're very, very common across life, but especially in prokaryotes, which don't have as complex cells. Eukaryotes will have even more complex gene regulation methods than operons. Although there are operons in eukaryotes as well. They are the bane of many biology students' existence, especially questions that ask about their regulation, uh, like an on or off switch. The Wallace line refers to an invisible biogeographic line that passes through Indonesia, and it's named after one of the great biologists of history, Alfred Russell Wallace. If you are to the west of the Wallace line, so see Borneo and Sumatra and Java on this map, the plants and animals tend to be more similar to those in Southeast Asia. So you'll find rhinos, elephants, and orangutans here. If you're to the east of the Wallace line, so see where Sulawesi and Flores are on the map, uh, they're more similar to life in Australia. So those places have marsupials and certain kinds of birds. So the life on each end of the Wallace line is very different. It's almost like there is an, an invisible barrier despite the two uh, regions being so close to each other. This is the result of lower sea levels during the Ice Age and uh, when the islands when some of the islands were connected by land. This allowed for animals from Asia or Australia to migrate to what are now the different islands, but the Wallace line represents where the islands were not connected, preventing mixture between the two sides. Alzheimer's disease is a neurological condition characterized by a steady progressive loss of memory and cognition. At the time I'm making this video, we don't have the clearest understanding in the world of what causes it, but we do know that it is related to the buildup of certain proteins in the brain and the subsequent loss of connections between neurons. There is so much that we can talk about it going to the specific proteins, the amyloid plaques and the uh, tau tangles, but honestly, uh, that's a video for another day. Hormones are molecules in the body that signal for specific responses. There are a lot, a lot of hormones. The one in this diagram shows the pathway for cortisol, but generally they follow negative feedback mechanisms. That means that when there is too much hormone buildup, the body will signal for the inhibition of its production. This works in large part because when your body signals for a specific hormone to be produced, it doesn't immediately result in that hormone's production. It acts on signaling hormones that often come from the pituitary gland in the brain which then acts on another gland like the thyroid or in this case the adrenal glands attached to the kidneys and that results in hormone production. So when there is a buildup of a hormone, it actually inhibits the production of the hormones that signal for its secretion. So very tightly regulated system that keeps your body in check. Speaking of hormones, the pancreas is the organ responsible for the synthesis of key hormones, namely insulin and glucagon. There are others, but these are the two main ones that you have probably heard about. Insulin tells your cells to take in glucose from the blood, whereas glucagon tells your cells to release it. So if you remember, we talked about glycogen earlier. Glucagon tell, uh, signals for the conversion of that glycogen back into glucose, as well as some other pathways by which you can get glucose, but let's not go into that right now. This is why if you have low insulin, it can correlate with high blood sugar. If you have type 1 diabetes, it involves the body not producing enough insulin, whereas if you have type 2 diabetes, it actually signals that your body's cells have become resistant to that insulin signal. The autonomic nervous system is the component of your nervous system which regulates involuntary body function. The first component of the autonomic nervous system is the sympathetic, which is responsible for the fight or flight response. So think about dilating your pupils and having a faster heartbeat. The second is the parathy the second is the parasympathetic nervous system which is responsible for the rest and digest response. So think about salivation and uh, your stomach grumbling. There is a third lesser known component of the autonomic nervous system called the enteric nervous system which are the nerves that govern your gut and they actually believe it or not can act independently of the brain and the spinal cord. So Sometimes the enteric nervous system is actually referred to as the second brain. Ugh, okay. Wow, that was... That was that was a lot. Uh, that was a lot of stuff in Tier 4. Uh, we're only going to go deeper from here. Now we are in Tier 5, and we are firmly in the realm of the more advanced biology. 
The Great American Biotic Interchange refers to a biological event roughly 2 million years ago when North and South America became connected at what is now Panama. As a result, many species from each continent were able to cross into the other. Elephants, mammoths, big cats, and even the ancestors of llamas, among many other species, crossed from North to South America while giant terror birds, the ground sloths, and the ancestors of armadillos, including, yes, the giant glyptodons, reached North America from South America, among many other different species. If I didn't already have this iceberg, I would probably spend an hour talking about the thousands of species that were involved in this interchange, but just for now, it is one of the most important biological exchanges in the last several million years. The Great Oxygenation was the emergence of oxygen producing life about 2.5 billion years ago, and it resulted in a huge boom in atmospheric oxygen on the early Earth. Or not that early Earth, 2.5 billion is already pretty far into Earth's history. Oxygen is actually toxic, so this would have resulted in the mass extinction of a lot of life that had existed before, which could not live in the presence of oxygen. LUCA stands for the last universal common ancestor of all life on Earth. This was almost certainly a unicellular anaerobe, so it could not live in oxygen, that lived in deep sea vents around 4 billion years ago. But other than that, we don't really know what exactly it was. It would not be the oldest life in history though, just the last form that is an ancestor to all current organisms. So at this point, most people have at least heard of the B vitamins. They are a class of water-soluble vitamins that are responsible for catalyzing a lot of your body's metabolism. So why they're important is because they are important in uh, you know, the energy production of the body. We will not be going into their functions here specifically as individuals, but they're often numbered B1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 9, and 12. The other numbers were skipped because they were found to not be essential for consumption. In numerical order, uh, they are thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, pantothenic acid. Uh, there's a whole class under B6 uh, consisting of pyridoxine, pyridoxal, and pyridoxamine, uh, biotin, folate, and cobalamin. Fun fact, because they are all water soluble. If you ingest too much vitamin B, it will simply pass in your urine. So if you see supplements that contain absurdly high amounts of vitamin B and actually vitamin C as well, your body will just pee out most of it. So yeah. Prions are misfolded proteins that are capable of causing diseases. They are proteins that cause diseases. They are almost borderline nightmarish. They, un unlike bacteria and viruses, they are resistant to heat and chemical denaturation. They are responsible for diseases like mad cow disease or kuru, the latter of which is known to be transmitted by cannibalism. Prions spread by causing other proteins to misfold too, and unlike literally any other pathogen that we know of, it does not use nucleic acids as genetic information. It is literally a rogue protein that functions as a disease-causing agent. Shmu is up there with SNRPs for the funniest name in all of biology. They're the little nodules that yeast cells will form and they project in the direction of pheromones that are sent out by other yeast and that allows them to move toward one another and eventually mate sexually. Yes, yeasts can mate. Bioelectrical fields are the fields produced by animals as a result of the electrical currents in their body. We talked about some of these when we talked about nerves. There is some evidence that suggests that bioelectrical fields help regulate animal development, especially even with wound healing. Cryptobiosis is a state some organisms can enter in, in which their metabolism will drop close to zero and they can survive extreme conditions. There are actually five types of cryptobiosis which govern different kinds of situations including water deprivation, freezing, heat, and low oxygen. Uh, it just depends on what kind of conditions it can survive. 
The most popular example you've probably heard of are water bears or tardigrades, which can perform all five forms of cryptobiosis, but there are other organisms like nematodes, rotifers, and brine shrimp that can also perform cryptobiosis. This may make it seem like they're immortal, but keep in mind that when they are in cryptobiosis, they are completely immobile and unresponsive. Translocons are special protein complexes that can attach to certain proteins on the surface of a plasma membrane. In humans, this is usually to attach a secretory protein onto the endoplasmic reticulum organelle, which you may remember from high school bio assists in protein production. I actually have a video on these already. It's called secretory protein synthesis, if you're interested. Before we talk about what exactly VDJ recombination is, remember that antibodies are special proteins which, if you remember from the central dogma, protein shape is dependent on the sequence of amino acids which comes from the sequence of the DNA. But if each antibody in your body is specifically shaped for each antigen, and there are millions of antigens in the world, and your body doesn't develop certain antibodies until it comes into contact with those antigens, how does your DNA learn to code for those antibodies? Your body has special cells called BNT cells which have a kind of template DNA sequence that codes for the basic uh, template antibody protein, so that um, kind of Y shape. When your body is exposed to a disease, your B cells go into overdrive and begin rearranging that DNA sequence into millions and millions of possible combinations, each of which becomes transcribed and translated into a slightly differently shaped antibody. This is called VDJ recombination. Inside the lymph nodes, uh, sample antigens from the pathogen upon exposure are tested against each of these trial antibodies until there's a match. Kind of like if you're on a dating app and you're just kept on swiping until there's a match. Once there is a match, your body just produces that antibody en masse, allowing you to fight that disease. And even afterward, you continue to produce that antibody, which is where your lifelong immunity to a disease comes from. Blots are lab techniques that are used to study different molecules in genetics. Funnily enough, there are four key ones and their names correspond to the four cardinal directions. The southern blot was named first and it detects DNA. Then there's the northern blot that detects RNA, the western blot that detects proteins, and the eastern blot that detects changes to a protein. Funnily enough, the first one to be invented was the southern blot named after Edwin Southern, its inventor, so not actually the, the, the direction, but the other ones kind of just play along with the name. They were kind of named to continue the, the, to complete the list. There is also the far western blot, the dot blot, and immunostaining, all of which are useful methods in biochemical analysis. The triskelion, that's this bottom uh, three prongs shape down here, uh, that it's a shape formed by complexes of protein called clathrin. When a vesicle or a small structure that contains its own lipid bilayer, like a tiny fatty molecular package, enters a cell, there is a clathrin coat shown, shown above that forms around it, and it's made up of triskelion shaped parts. And this clathrin helps maintain the shape of the vesicle, and the vesicle then can be directed around and into the cell. Chinese hamster ovary cells are the most commonly used mammalian cells for protein therapy production. It's not like there are millions of Chinese hamsters in cages being used for drug production. That would be really sad. But instead, it's a cloned cell line from a few Chinese hamster ovaries that were harvested in the past, kind of like the HeLa cells we discussed earlier. However, there are millions of lab animals that are commonly used for research, and even with animal welfare guidelines, there are still concerns about their rights and suffering. KRAS is a gene that is important in telling cells to divide and differentiate. Mutations in KRAS are a very common cause of cancer. In fact, about 20% of cancers have a mutation in the KRAS gene. This is why KRAS is called a proto-oncogene. This makes it one of the most important targets in cancer research. The Grant Finch studies refer to the work of Peter and Rosemary Grant, a British scientist couple who have been studying the finches that Darwin saw in the Galapagos Islands since the 1970s and have actually observed them evolving over the course of only a few years, to the point where they saw speciation in real time. Yes, yeah, so if anyone tells you evolution is too slow to be observed, the Grants saw it. I love this book about them, The Beak of the Finch. 
uh, and it details a lot about why their work is so important to the history of biology. This is some, one of some of the most important experiments in the history of evolutionary biology to the point where I would argue that we should stop calling them Darwin's finches and just start calling them the Grant's finches. An EKG or an electrocardiogram, so sometimes called an ECG, is a record of your heart's electrical activity. It's often measured at the hospital with the electrodes that they place all over your body, and it gives medical professionals info on the heart's activity. Each spike corresponds to a change in the potential of the muscles of the heart. So for example, the really big peak, the QRS complex, shows the depolarization of the ventricles. And uh, the depolarization of nerves is actually what uh, allows for the signal of an actual potential. It's part of the nerves layer, uh, part of the nerves entry that we were discussing earlier in the iceberg. So that QRS complex signals ventricular contraction, aka blood was pumped out of the heart. If you know what each of these curves mean, you can actually take a look at an abnormal EKG and get an idea as to what kind of condition someone has. I debated going on a tangent here and showing you how exactly this EKG works. That's normally something that's taught to EMTs or nurses or, uh, you know, doctors. Uh, that's too much of a tangent, and I feel like I would confuse myself. Our bodies. So, when you have two X chromosomes, one of the X chromosomes actually becomes inactive and condenses into something called a bar body that can no longer be used for transcription. The most commonly taught example of this are in calico cats. Each hair cell color depends on which of the X chromosomes was inactivated. This means that calico cats are all female, two X chromosomes. Usually. Sex is complex. Cell signal transduction refers to the chemical mechanism by which cells process information based on signals from their environment, usually by the binding of molecules to their receptors. It's usually done by a series of phosphorylations, so a series of proteins become uh, phosphorylated, meaning that that phosphate molecule that we talked about earlier when we were discussing ATP gets attached. So think of it kind of like a relay race where the phosphate is the baton and it's passed from protein to protein in a relay race. There are a ton of pathways that biology students learn about. Uh, normally you begin by learning about the main kinds of receptors that begin signal transduction. So the GPCRs, voltage-gated channels, protein kinases, internal receptors, among others, but those are the four main ones you will learn about. And then the information gets passed on to second messengers, which carry the signal into the cell. There are way too many pathways to talk about. I have memorized exactly zero of them because memorizing them, it's not really that useful. But the one shown in this diagram is a very common one called a MAP kinase cascade. This is a very common kind of signaling pathway and small modifications can cause different changes. Glycosylated proteins are proteins that are modified with sugar chains, showing that the four molecules that we talked about earlier can actually become more intertwined the deeper you go into bio. This is actually more common than you might think. These sugar chains are very important in directing proteins to specific locations and allowing them to communicate. The one that you are probably most familiar with is actually A1C. So when hemoglobin attaches to glucose, we call it HbA1c. The percentage of hemoglobin in your blood that is glycosylated is the percentage that we normally call the A1c level and that is diagnostic for diabetes. The cytokine storm refers to a physiological process in which uh, you become sick and your body signals for chemicals called cytokines and the cytokine signal for inflammation immune, and immune response. This is perfectly normal, but when infection becomes too uncontrolled, it can actually lead to too many cytokines being produced too quickly, resulting in the cytokine storm. This excessive inflammation and immune response can actually lead to the immune system damaging your organs, which, as you can imagine, in extreme cases, can lead to... Clotting is the extremely complex biochemical pathway by which your body can signal for the formation of a blood clot, and that prevents the injury after... It doesn't prevent the injury. Wait a minute, it doesn't prevent injury? Why did I say that? It prevents the bleeding after an injury. Wait, it doesn't even prevent... It, it prevents... It, it plugs the injury up, basically. Oh my god. I'm... It is the bane of the existence of upper-level biology students uh, because of all the different factors that are involved and they're distinguished by their Roman numeral. And there's also the fact that there are two different pathways. There's an 
extrinsic and an intrinsic pathway, but they all converge at a certain point, and they all end in the formation of our protein called fibrin, which together with the platelets in your blood, plug the wound site. RNA world hypothesis is the hypothesis that before DNA and protein existed, there was a time when billions of years ago, the precursors to life were self-replicating molecules of RNA. It's pretty widely accepted actually, because while DNA can carry genetic information and proteins can catalyze reactions, RNA can actually do both. Yes, get yourself a molecule that can do both. Walking fish refers to the fact that there are fish who can walk on land. Yes, I know that millions of years ago there were fish-like animals that made the transition to walking on land like Tiktaalik, and as you know, or may know, there are mudskippers that can jump onto land. Not that the two are closely related. They're actually not even remotely closely related. However, there are other fish that can walk on land uh, and survive on land for extended periods of time. Like lungfish, snakeheadfish, gouramis, some catfish can do it, bashirs, blennies, and even a shark. A shark. That's this one. It's called the epaulette shark. And what's interesting is that this ability to walk on land and survive in air did not come from a shared fish common ancestor. They all evolved this independently. So, pretty useful trait, probably. Alcanovorax is a species of bacteria that can eat petroleum. Petroleum. Specifically the alkane components, but that is organic chemistry. They thrive in oil spill locations, and there's some research into using them to clean up oil spills in a process called bioremediation. I actually wanted to do my ninth grade science research project on them, but I was unable to find a place to buy them online, so I went to a gas station and took a sample of water thinking that there was a chance that they would be there. They were probably not there. Forms refers to the fact that there are actually different conformations of the DNA double helix, uh, kind of like stretching or compressing an image. So in the middle of this diagram, we have B DNA. It is the most common kind, the one that you're familiar with. But we've also observed to the right of that Z DNA, which can be seen when DNA has been silenced by a process called methylation. To the left, there is also A DNA, which has not been seen in nature, at least not as far as I know yet. Uh, not yet, but it is often found in dehydrated DNA, which is used in labs. So when Rosalind Franklin actually discovered DNA, she found A DNA, not B DNA. Panspermia is the hypothesis that life did not originate on Earth, but actually came from outer space in the form of comets and asteroids billions of years ago. I should say that there is currently no good evidence to suggest that this is the origin of life, but there have been organic compounds or at least some tangential evidence suggesting that organic compounds can be found in outer space. Fascia referred to the layers of tissue that connect the body's organs and various structures together. Doctors originally considered them to be pretty passive, uh, but now we know that they're quite important. They reduce friction between muscles. They are important in sensory perception, body flexibility, and general body organization. Humans are fish, so in evolution, we like to classify organisms into monophyletic clades, so once you share a common ancestor, you never outgrow that ancestry. This means that since we, as humans, evolved from fish, we are still technically fish. It also means that whales are fish, so that's kind of ironic because we normally teach people, oh no, whales are not fish, they are mammals. But uh, if you follow this logic, all mammals are also fish. It is a thought experiment. No one generally calls whales fish. It's still more accurate to say, or more precise to say that they're mammals. But yeah, it does pose some strange questions about how we classify life. ADMET refers to the five main criteria that are used in pharmacology when studying how a drug travels throughout the body. They are absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, and toxicity. You gotta stay hydrated. So yeah, it is roughly at this point in the iceberg when I start kind of losing my mind. We are now below the iceberg and it is now time to go into the relatively niche areas of research. Some of these kind of kind of threw me in for a loop, so yeah, let's get into it. Stages of prophase. 
uh, refer to the fact that prophase 1 in meiosis is actually quite involved because it requires DNA from different chromosomes to exchange their DNA. It's a process called crossing over. This means that prophase 1 is further divided into several stages that represent the formation of this uh, complex. It's called a synaptonemal complex. Uh, these are leptotene, zygotene, pachytene, diplotene, and diakinesis. Mice scorpion painkiller refers to something I learned about in which grasshopper mice are actually immune to the venom of bark scorpions. Now, okay, fine, on its own, that's not that impressive. A lot of animals are immune to venom, especially if they live with those predators a lot. But what takes these mice to the next level is that they actually use the scorpion venom as a painkiller. It has to do with the venom inhibiting a key voltage-gated protein that is responsible for processing electrical nerve pain signals. And just to emphasize how important amino acids and protein folding are, the difference between the venom being toxic and a painkiller is a single mutation of a single amino acid. One amino acid out of thousands was enough to cause this change in these mice. So let's imagine like if you have a paragraph and you change one letter and it changes the entire meaning of the paragraph. Unnatural amino acids refers to the fact that outside of the 20 essential biological amino acids in humans, uh, technically there are two other special ones that can be found in life on earth. Uh, there are actually amino acids which have been engineered by scientists that do not exist in nature but in theory can be used in reactions similar to amino acids so they exist in labs we can make them they have the right chemistry to form proteins but they have artificial components that give them new reactivities it's an incredibly interesting part of the world of biochemistry and it blew my mind when there were amino acids beyond the 20 that i had to memorize Yes, I have memorized how to draw all 20 amino acids. This is not that abnormal in among biochemistry students and especially among pre-meds. It was suffering. Generation sequencing refers to modern methods that have developed within the last 30 years to sequence DNA. They are much faster, more precise, and more efficient than previously developed methods that probably I would have placed around like tier 3, honestly. One of the most important methods in biochemistry is alumina sequencing, which allows for, and I'm not going to go into the process of how alumina sequencing works here, it's, it's much more complicated than the other techniques that we've discussed so far, but it allows for the sequencing of millions, millions of fragments simultaneously, and then a computer can piece together what the original larger fragment was like. It kind of just blows my mind how easily we can sequence a genome now and how far we've come in genetics. Honestly, we're living in a genetics revolution nowadays. Sonic Hedgehog Gene is one of the funniest gene names of all time. It's a gene found in all animals that codes for specific proteins that uh, control the formation of orgo organs and embryos of all animals. They are very important in the formation of organ systems and their directionality, uh, which means that mutations in the Sonic Hedgehog gene can cause uh, very, very detrimental diseases. A lot of the times the fetus does not survive to birth. This does mean that the Sonic Hedgehog gene can come up in very serious conversations a doctor has with uh, birthing people and to bring up such a goofy name in such a serious conversation uh, can be seen as inappropriate in the world of medicine which is why it's normally in the medical context just called the SHH gene. It does bring up the important point about doctors being able to communicate with their patients and uh, being empathetic towards certain situations. If you're wondering how it got its name, the guy who discovered it, his wife brought home a Sonic the Hedgehog game ad and that's how the gene got its name. Red and Mirabile are flowing blood vessel systems that follow a concept called counter-current exchange. If you've studied physiology or chemical engineering or biomedical engineering, this, is, this may be something that you are familiar with already. In counter-current exchange, you have two flowing systems against one another so that the areas of highest concentration difference are in contact with another. That allows for the most efficient possible flow of chemicals or sometimes heat between the two systems. It can also occur in a single system so long as it forms a loop, right? So uh, it's some key examples in engineering are cooling systems in uh, engineering plants. Retamorabulate are the biological versions of these that use blood vessels and 
They are found everywhere. They are used by fish to maintain their body temperature. They are found in your kidneys to filter out toxins. They can concentrate sea, uh, salt in seabirds that allow them to sneeze out the salt that they uh, take in. I actually have a very old video on my channel where I discuss how giraffes also use these systems and it allows them to maintain the blood pressure in their heads kind of like if you imagine when they when they th it takes a very powerful heart to pump blood up to their head along their neck and so when they they bring their heads down to drink water that pressure should crush their skulls but instead uh, the retamorabole actually protect it. Uh, I didn't mention the physics of it when I was making that video because I did not know this back then. I did not know a lot of stuff back then. Most stuff I did not know. Arguably a lot of stuff I still... Actually a lot of stuff I still don't know. We are always learning. Conodonts are an extinct group of jawless fish and their teeth are so common as fossils that paleontologists use them to determine how old rock layers are. Certain kind of conodont teeth indicate how a certain geological period and so they are often used as what are called index fossils so if you find a certain kind of dot tooth in a certain kind of rock you can tell what period of earth's history that rock came from biological sex uh i'm putting it this low to you know bring up some points about how some people <laughs> often like to say that biological sex is not that complicated. It is X and Y. This is absolutely an oversimplification of real life. There is a staggering diversity of what some would call uh, intersex combinations of uh, sex chromosomes that throw the entire sex binary into question. This is not even factoring in how hormones, which are responsible for the expression of an individual's observable traits, can act independently of the sex chromosomes, or how neuroscience or the wiring of the brain plays into this. It does not help that people often confuse sex, which is the generally the more biological component, with gender, which is a purely sociological construct. And this is only humans, by the way. Other organisms are much, much more complicated. Science does not give you an excuse to discriminate against people. The Azola Bloom refers to a biological event that occurred 50 million years ago, during which the world was much warmer due to higher concentrations of CO2, which is a greenhouse gas. I just realized... I forgot to include... I just realized I didn't include climate change in the iceberg. Maybe that's a little ironic. During this time, the Arctic was warm enough to, how, to be home to turtles and crocodiles at the poles. Uh, massive amounts of a plant called Azola began blooming in the Arctic at this time, and when the Azola began to die off, they sank to the bottom of the Arctic Ocean and actually locked a lot of carbon with them at the bottom of the seafloor. This decrease in carbon dioxide caused so much global cooling that it dropped the average Arctic sea ice temperature from uh, 13 to negative 9 degrees Celsius. Uh, so yes, this mass die-off of plants created our modern cool period. I should note here that there are regular cycles of global, global cooling and uh, warming. Uh, the current period of global warming is so extreme and happening so quickly that it must be caused by human burning of greenhouse gases. DNA libraries refer to DNA fragments cloned within microorganisms that are stored for research. There are many kinds that differ in their mechanisms and applications, but all allow for the cloning of a specific gene that allows for the study of said gene. There are even some libraries where scientists want uh, the cloning to be done imperfectly, allowing for the generation of new mutants. This way not only can uh, new proteins be generated, but also they can serve as starting points for what's called directed evolution. Yes, scientists directing the evolution of bacteria in the lab. Organ X refers to a newly invented system which in 2022 allowed for a team of scientists to effectively revive pig organs. They isolated a brain, heart, liver, and kidney and using this machine were able to restore some of their biological activity including the heart activity and cellular repair. This doesn't mean that we're bringing animals back from the dead but this is it this was a massive story. It's a huge leap forward in biomedical engineering. The fact that they were able to effectively 
revive organs using a system like this. AlphaFold is an AI program that in recent years was able to use deep learning to predict the folding pattern of proteins. The protein folding problem has been a very important problem in biochemistry because it can be very difficult to predict how exactly a protein will develop its shape based on an amino acid sequence. This was an extremely important leap forward in our understanding of proteomics, and it helped solve one of the biggest problems in biology which stand for proteolysis targeting chimeras, are special three-part chemicals that, rather than serving as inhibitors of proteins, target the proteins for degradation in the cell. So cells can destroy targeted proteins if they're tagged with a molecule called ubiquitin. Uh, it kind of functions as a kick me sign, or rather a destroy me sign. So any protein that has that ubiquitin tag on it gets destroyed. Uh, protax bind not just to a specific protein, but also the enzymes that call for that kind of self-destruction. And uh, as a result, they can actually do more than just inhibit the function of that protein, they outright call for its destruction. One of the current hot areas of PROTAC research involves targeting estrogen receptors to stop the spread of breast cancer. The Dutch famine refers to a 1944-1945 famine that occurred in the Netherlands as a result of Nazi occupation. Pregnant women during the famine had smaller and less healthy babies, as you can imagine, but the interesting thing is not only were their children less healthy, but their grandchildren who were born long, long after the famine uh, to parents who did not even live through the famine specifically uh, they also had uh, smaller birth sizes and were more prone to disease. This does not make any kind of sense given what we know about genetics and suggested that there was some kind of epigenetic change that happened to the mother's eggs that was passed down through multiple generations. And it has massive implications for both genetics and epidemiology and contributed to what we call our understanding of intergenerational inheritance. Organisms refer to organisms that live connected to one another uh, and are interdependent, and they include corals, some algae, uh, the Portuguese man of war. Uh, Portuguese man of war is actually a siphonophore, and siphonophores are extremely complex ocean dwelling colonial organisms that are made up of tiny relatives of jellyfish, not quite jellyfish, but related. And the largest is the giant siphonophore shown over here. It's the big one in the middle of this diagram. It can grow up to 50 meters long. It is one of the longest animals, potentially the longest animal that we know of in the world today. And just imagine a 50 meter Congo line of tiny microscopic polyps and jellyfish-like things. The ocean has some weird animals. Okay folks, so this one, this one really got to me. This is probably where I started to... Ugh. Back so it, we often learn in school, and even on the college level, that bacteria don't have organelles. That is... so that is not true. I found that out, that that's not inherently true. They actually do have uh, organelles surrounded by a, a lipid bilayer membrane sometimes. Uh, cyanobacteria can have thylakoids capable of photosynthesis. A lot of bacteria evol involved in the nitrogen cycle have something called an anamoxazone, which allows them to convert ammonia back into atmospheric nitrogen gas. But the by far, the one that got me the most was the fact that there, it's, it's, this was one of the diagram. There are bacteria that have an organelle called a magnetosome, and the magnetosome contains magnetic nanoparticles that help the bacteria align with the Earth's magnetic field. What? That's a bacteria! Oh my god. There's some weird stuff in- oh. Is biology crazy? Before we discuss what the xenophyophore is, I have to say that uh, there is no requirement that cells are restricted to one nucleus. So you can have cells with two, three, hundreds of nuclei. That is what this is. Xenophyophores are gigantic 
unicellular organisms uh, that are multinucleated, so they have multiple nuclei. That allows them to grow much larger than other cells. And yes, I know that there's the square cube law that uh, limits the size of a cell, but uh, these are kind of exceptions. But what you are looking at in this picture is a single cell. And it is not tiny, it is 20 centimeters long. This is 20 centimeters. There is a single cell with a diameter like that. Align it. So it's. Can we do it? Kind of like that. Yeah. There is a cell that is that big in this world. Fairy flies are a family of, you guessed it, wasps that are notable for their tiny size. How small? This is Decopom. Decopomorpha. Ecmepterygus. We're gonna go with that. Uh, they are the smallest insects known. How small? They are, the, the males at least, are on average 186 micrometers. Micrometers. That not only makes them the smallest insects, they are smaller than amoebas, and they are smaller than some bacteria. That means that there is a wasp that is smaller than some cells. Induced pluripotency refers to the introduction of specific transcription factors into non-stem cells that can literally revert them back into stem cells, uh, and it's caused by the expression of certain proteins. The main case that I know about is a cocktail of mRNA transcription factors called, uh, collectively, OSKMLN, I call it OSKMLN, I'm not sure if that's actually how the scientists say it, but I'm going to call it that. It was able to revert human skin cells back into stem cells after two weeks. Two weeks of daily transfusions. This has huge applications in aging research and honestly is the closest thing that we have to a de-aging potion. But speaking of de-aging, extinction is the theoretical process of using Actually, not theoretical. It is the process of using genetic engineering methods to bring back an extinct species, and it is closer to reality than you think. In 2003, the Pyrenean ibex was brought back from extinction for a few minutes. The clone died, but some researchers are proposing bringing back species that have been extinct for much longer. So the Pyrenean ibex had only been extinct for a few years. Some people are proposing bringing back the thylacine or the woolly mammoth. We are not anywhere near that yet, but the research is very interesting, very ethically fraught, honestly. I'm not sure how I feel about that, but it's very weird genetics. Ediacare and Biota refer to the bizarre life that existed on Earth before the Cambrian explosion. Most of these organisms may look like plants, but they are definitely not plants. We don't really know exactly what they are, but they are definitely not plants. It is very, very, very difficult to establish their placement on the evolutionary tree of life. Hypotheses range from a lot of these being proto-animals to allergy to some other group that is beyond our current understanding of life. Oh my god. We are now at the bottom of the iceberg. Here, we're going to be going into some of the big unsolved problems in biology and into things that are so bizarre, they, some of these are like, very little evidence for them. I would argue that they go into the realm of science fiction, they push the limits of biology, They're, some of these are extremely theoretical, uh, and they don't always make sense, but uh, we're at the bottom of the iceberg, so what do you expect? The Red Queen Hypothesis is a hypothesis that states that species must constantly evolve in order to compete with other species, and it explains, uh, or it's theorized to explain, the origin of sex, as sexual reproduction allows for offspring to be genetically different from their parents, increasing variation and allowing for past evolution. There is a counter hypothesis called the Court Jester Hypothesis, which states that environmental Non-living factors are the main driving force of evolution, not competition with other species. Honestly, if you ask me, both of these are true. I don't... I don't know. We're at the bottom. <laughs> Cetotecta is a group of crustaceans that are notable because 
we don't know what they look like as adults. Yeah, so the, the top of this diagram, that's their juvenile form. That's what they look like as babies. And that's actually what baby crustaceans often look like. This is not out of the ordinary. But we have never observed them reproducing and we do not know what they look like when they grow up. And they're everywhere in the ocean. They're found in all kinds of marine habitats. So they must be successful. They must be breeding. We just don't know what they look like. And I, I also asked, why don't we just grow them in aquariums? Apparently, it doesn't work, right? They, they don't get off. They don't reproduce in aquariums. So in 2008, some biologists tried to solve this problem uh, by, and it's a really clever method, honestly, they exposed the babies to a growth hormone to force them to grow up. And what they got is what's shown in B. It's called an ipsigon. That is an unsegmented mass of cells. It looked more like a worm than anything else, but it was basically a barely functioning, if at all, animal in quotes. So this led to those researchers hypothesizing that the adult form of facet detecta is some kind of parasite and it needs a host to function. So uh, we just have not found its host yet. And we also don't know what it would look like in that host. Maybe it's that blob of cells. Uh, to this day, uh, at least from what I was able to find, uh, we do not know yet what it looks like as an adult. I hope we do find out eventually, though, is one of the great unsolved mysteries in biology. Uh, but speaking of weird life cycles, this is, of all the animals I know of, this might be the weirdest animal. I do not even know if I can finish this entry without losing my mind. They are called rhizocephalins. They are a group of parasitic barnacles and they have the most insane life cycle I have ever learned about. Uh, I'm going to simplify it a lot to avoid using a lot of the weird terminology. Uh, they start off looking pretty normal. Uh, they look like what no baby barnacles normally look like. And by the way, this is the this is how we know that they are barnacles, because afterwards, shit goes off the rails. The females will eventually find a host crab, and it transforms into what's called a kentragon. Uh, the kentragon is a structure. It's, it's technically the whole animal, but it is nothing but the antenna of the barnacle and then a mass of cells. I, I really mean it. It's, it's a mass of cells. It's not even a... It doesn't even resemble a barnacle anymore. It then injects itself like that mask, it injects itself into the body of the crab, into its circulatory system. And then it morphs into threads that spread throughout the crab's body. I'm not, there's a reason why I chose not to show a photo of it, okay? It's nasty. If you want to look up what these look like, you can, right? You can look up photos if you want. It's nasty. But they spread their way through the crab's body and, uh, yeah, it gets worse. So this barnacle, or I shouldn't call it a barnacle, it's a demon. This demon, right, then possesses the crab, literally possesses it, takes control of the crab's nervous system, uh, and it produces a sac called an externa on the on the uh, bottom uh, of like where the crab's gonads normally would be. Uh, and they carry the, the eggs. Now, notice how in the beginning I said female. So where is the male rhizocephalin barnacle throughout all of this? Well, the male becomes a mass of cells just like the female. However, it literally only exists to implant itself into the external. And that is not that rare. In the animal kingdom, there are a lot of animals where the male just exists solely for the purpose of producing sperm, but it also just devolves into a mass of cells that can produce sperm and it literally enters the externa. And it fertilizes from there, but it's not even a functioning animal, arguably not a functioning animal at that point. I mean, it's just 
a mass of injected sperm cells and to the external and then this we could just put this crab out of its suffering right it's already been hijacked its body has been hijacked by a freaking literally possession and i know there's a lot of parasites in the world that possess their hosts but the fact that this one is going through so many bizarre stages from there the externa will uh, release the eggs and this terrifying horrifying life cycle can start all over again honestly this is not even a mystery on par with the other entries on this iceberg but the fact that it's so weird it pushes the limits of zoology in my opinion now, i'm not a zoologist but this is really pushing the limit of animal life cycles it is fascinating it is also horrifying this yeah let's just move on holobionts refer to organisms plus the organisms that live on or around them so think of you and your microbiome think of trees and the things that live in trees uh, some scientists and philosophers have said that we should start thinking of holobionts instead of individuals because of the interconnectedness of these individuals uh, this is really a valid point it really changed the way that i thought about biology as a student of biology microbiomes literally change behavior and you can't really think about the biology of say seagrass without the things that call them home right so yeah interesting thought experiment in the philosophy of biology. The universal flu vaccine uh, refers to the search for a catch-all vaccine that can trigger immunity against all variants of influenza. Influenza mutates so rapidly every year that it is impossible, or at least for decades, it has been impossible to make a universal flu vaccine that you don't need to get a new one for every year. mRNA technology opened the door for the search for an mRNA vaccine that can give universal immunity to influenza. At the time I am recording this video, there are experimental trials with such a vaccine, so we'll find out in coming years if scientists have been successful. The Pelly Monster is one of my favorite prehistoric animals of all time. It is a 300 million year old fossil that has defied all attempts to classify it. We do not know if it is a vertebrate or an invertebrate. We don't know if it has a backbone or not. We don't. So, so, okay, what you're looking at here, this is an artist's recreation. I should probably show you a fossil of it. Hold on. I'll show you the fossil. But those are eye stalks, by the way. And then, so it's like, oh my gosh, where, where's mine? So, like, this is the, the mouth thing. And then there are stalks coming out that would be its eyes. This is the Tully Monster fossil. This is what we are working with. Yeah. This is one of the greatest mysteries in all of paleontology. Like the fact that we have studied this for so many years and still do not have, we're, 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 we don't even know what it is. It, I love it. The evolution of consciousness. Uh, we do not know how consciousness evolved in life. And there's a whole rabbit hole that we can go down in evolutionary psychology. Uh, needless to say, we have hypotheses but no concrete answers, and there's still even debate as to what consciousness is, like what animals we would consider conscious or sentient, uh, but our understanding of animal intelligence has improved dramatically over time, and we now understand animals to be a lot more conscious than we previously thought. Astrobiology is the theoretical study of life on other planets. We have not yet found life on other planets, as of 2023, June 2023, but we do have evidence of organic compounds on the moons of Saturn and on comets and asteroids, suggesting that there is at the very least the possibility of life in space. Uh, this is kind of interesting because it leads to the next idea, which I have to, I have to give the disclaimer that the next entry on this iceberg is not a widely accepted idea. It's actually it's actually bullshit, but uh, it's just so funny I had to include it here. Octopuses are aliens refers to a 2018 scientific peer-reviewed paper that promoted panspermia by proposing that life from outer space caused the Cambrian explosion and that extraterrestrial vi <laughs> extraterrestrial viruses infected squid and changed their DNA. And that's where octopuses come from. Now, I should say that 
I don't know, there's no proof of this, but I think it's funny how this was accepted into a peer-reviewed journal. And then it went viral. Xenobots. Xenobots are AI-generated life forms. And these... These things are made up of actual cells derived from the stem cells of African clawed frogs. And so they're, they're AI generated, so an AI designed them and then put them together. Uh, and they are capable of performing functions and moving how engineers want. They can self-assemble, they can self-heal if they are damaged, they can even remember they can remember things that happen to them and i'm not going to go into the experiment of how they did it and if that's not enough they can self-replicate now are they alive are they robots are they w whatever you want to call them i don't know and scientists do not know either but they change everything that we know about biology. We used to say that artificial life is science fiction. If these things are alive, we have crossed over into the, the deep, we have gone into the bottom of the biology iceberg. These things honestly terrify me. Like, I'm, uh, the, the rise of cephalons may be the weirdest animal that I have ever encountered, that I've ever heard of. These are possibly the scariest things in all of biology in my opinion because the implication is that we have crossed now into the realm of effectively creating something that we need to have a debate on as to it's alive or not. Non-carbon life refers to the theoretical idea that life could have evolved on a form based not on the element carbon but rather on the element silicon or other elements. So uh, on the periodic table, elements in the same column tend to behave similarly. Uh, we're not going to go into the chemistry of that here, but if you are interested, it has to do with their valence. And so a lot of science fiction has suggested that silicon, which is directly beneath carbon on the periodic table, can also be the basis for life on other planets. This is an idea that has captured the attention of astrobiologists since, you know, if you have alien life surrounding silicon, is a whole new world of biology that you can explore. There is no evidence that any life has ever evolved uh, with silicon, and there are some problems with the chemistry of it, uh, but it is interesting to consider. There are other elements that have been considered for a non-carbon based life, but silicon is, if, if it does exist, silicon is probably most likely what it is based on. Finally, at the bottom of the iceberg, we have the shadow biosphere. This is a real thing, or rather a real idea in biology. So the, the idea behind the shadow biosphere is that there is an entire world of living things on Earth that remain undiscovered because they follow different rules of biochemistry. So the same lab techniques that we've developed, the same things we've, uh, you know, we've been trained to look for, they fall. These organisms would follow completely different laws of biochemistry, and thus, uh, you know, may slip under our radars. So. Uh, this involves the potential for silicon-based life, but also things like, you know, and I'm not, you know, uh, alternate chirality amino acids. So for, uh, you know, there's like a left and right-handed, all amino acids that we know of are uh, left-handed is the possibility of other amino acids, uh, other solvents that, you know, so water is the universal solvent of biology. There are other potential solvents that exist. Uh, yeah, so the shadow biosphere is a really interesting idea to consider because it, Push it, it asks us to push our understanding of uh, what life is, where it can be found, and what kinds of chemistry can exist. Now, it's it, there is no proof of this idea. Okay, I, I don't have to tell you, hopefully, that we don't have proof of a shadow bi biosphere that exists on Earth. Uh, it serves more as a thought experiment of what of the limits of biology. Honestly, there is enough biology out there for me to do like three of these. We have barely uh, scratched the surface. Although I, th I feel like this gives a good
kind of broad understanding of some of the key players in biology. Uh, but yeah, there's always room for more here. There is a, a lot of biology to cover. Maybe one day I'll talk about the other side of my degree and do a chemistry iceberg. I don't know if anyone would be interested in that. But yeah, as always, if you enjoyed this video, and uh, this one was a lot, but if you enjoyed it, uh, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know what your favorite part of the iceberg was. Let me know if there was anything that blew your mind as well. Let me know if there are any other icebergs you want me to do in the future. Another biology video, uh, more chemistry, but uh, yeah. So, uh, hope you learned something, hope you have fun, and yeah, thanks for watching.